Welcome to this crash course on the foundations of brain behavior and cognition. Let's get started. Our nervous system receives, processes, stores, and produces information, and consists of two parts. The central nervous system, CNS, which includes the brain, protected by the skull, and your spinal cord, protected by your spine, and the peripheral nervous system, PNS, which is the rest of the nerves that connect to all over the body. The peripheral nervous system can be further divided into autonomic or involuntary and somatic or voluntary nervous systems. The autonomic system can be even further subdivided into the sympathetic or flight or fight system and parasympathetic or calming rest and digest system. A behavior is any physiological response elicited by our nervous system. Overt behaviors are ones that you can see, like movements, and covert behaviors are ones that you can't, like thinking. We also have autonomic, automatic behaviors, like our heart beating, homeostatic behaviors that maintain us, like eating, and higher cognitive behaviors like learning. The brain can be divided into four regions, the occipital lobe for vision, the temporal lobe for hearing, the parietal lobe for sensory and spatial information, and the frontal lobe for higher level cognitive information. The brain also has sulci, or small grooves, fissures, or large grooves, and bulges between them called gyri. These make the brain look wrinkled, but this gives the brain a greater surface area and thus higher processing power. The spine consists of 33 individual bones which make up the vertebral column which is divided into the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx regions. The spinal cord, contained by the spine, consists of nerves that innervate or connect to and control the parts of the body that are at the same level as. The cranial nerves are 12 pairs of nerves that innervate, respectively, the left and right sides of the head and neck. There are two classes of cells in the nervous system. Neurons, which are the functional cells, which receive, process, and store information via chemical signals and electrical impulses, and glial cells, which provide critical support and maintenance for neurons. Neurons can be divided into four parts, the cell body or gray matter, the dendrites, the axon or white matter, and the presynaptic axon terminal. Neurons can be classified in many different ways, whether by shape, dendrite properties, axon projections, function, or primary neurotransmitters used, with over 200 different types of known neurons. Glial cells can also be classified in many ways, with astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglia being a couple of the primary ones in the CNS and Schwann cells being a primary one in the PNS. Neurons have synapses, axons, dendrites, and generate electrical activity, whereas glial cells do not, but glial cells can replicate themselves. The brain forms from a neural tube consisting of the proencephalon, or forebrain, mesencephalon, or midbrain, and rhomencephalon, or hindbrain. The brain is also covered by three protective membranes called the meninges, which consists of the tough external dura mater, the arachnoid in the middle, and the inner pia mater. Note that a nerve consists of several nerve fibers, where each nerve fiber is a single axon. The brain also has four interconnected cavities called ventricles, which are filled with cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, and is also surrounded by blood vessels. CSF helps protect and support the brain and eliminate waste, and the blood supplies it with nutrients, oxygen, and glucose. There's also a blood-brain barrier surrounding the brain, which allows for selective access of molecules to reach the brain. Fun fact, the brain is only 2% of the body's weight but uses 20% of the body's energy. There are many stains which allow us to visualize the nervous system. Golgi stains completely stain a small number of cells. Nissel stains are attracted to RNA and stain the entire cell body. Fluorescent stains bind to proteins and then fluoresce or shine under certain light. And immunohistochemical stains bind to and tag proteins with antibodies which then turn brown. Unfortunately, these stains can only be used with brain tissue which has been removed from the body. More recent techniques like Brainbow and Clarity can allow us to look at a whole networks, which is super cool. There are also other imaging techniques which allow us to look at a live brain. These include CAT scans, which use X-ray radiation, MRI, which uses radio frequency energy, PET, which uses temporarily radioactive glucose to measure brain activity, fMRI, which uses oxygen consumption to map brain activity, and MEG, which uses the brain's magnetic fields to map brain activity. Neurons communicate at synapses where the presynaptic talking neuron releases chemicals called neurotransmitters from its presynaptic axon terminal into the synaptic cleft, the 10 to 15 nanometer gap between the presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes. And then these neurotransmitters then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic listening neurons. Neurons can also communicate via gap junctions, which are even tinier spaces through which ions can flow. This is a much faster form of communication. Neurons are completely surrounded by an eight to 10 nanometer thick neuronal membrane, which consists of lipids, making the lipid bilayer, and proteins, both on the outside of the membrane and embedded within the membrane. Transport across the semi membrane can occur passively through passive diffusion, filtration, facilitated diffusion, and actively through active transport. 
The difference in overall charge of the ions in the cytoplasm, the inside of the cell, and the extracellular environment, the outside of the cell, sets up a membrane potential. There are two forces acting on the ions, the diffusion or chemical force, where ions tend to move from high to low concentrations, and the electrostatic force, where positive ions repel and oppositely charged ions attract. The resting potential, or difference in potential, of the inside versus the outside of the cell at rest is about negative 65 millivolts in neurons, which means that the inside is more negative. The extracellular fluid tends to have more sodium and chloride ions, whereas the intracellular fluid tends to have more potassium. The sodium-potassium pump, which actively pumps three sodium ions out of the cell, while pumping two potassium ions into the cell, helps maintain the resting potential. Hyperpolarization is where the inside of the cell becomes more negative, causing an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or IPSP. Depolarization is where the inside of the cell becomes less negative, or more positive, causing an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP. If the membrane potential at the axon hilla reaches negative 55 millivolts, the threshold, from a big enough EPSP, an active potential will occur. Voltage-gated sodium channels will open and allow sodium to rush in, which causes the membrane potential to reach around positive 55 millivolts. Then, potassium starts to rush out since the membrane potential is so positive, which sends the membrane potential back down. The resting potential is overshot a bit, so the sodium-potassium pump has to balance it out during what is called the refractory period. The action potential speeds down the axon, which is myelinated or insulated. The nerve impulse undergoes saltatory conduction, where it basically hops from tiny uninsulated areas on the axon called nodes of Ranvier. Once the nerve impulse, the depolarization, reaches the axon terminal, neurotransmitters are released via exocytosis and bind to the receiving neuron, which can cause yet another action potential in that neuron. Some of the most important neurotransmitters are glutamate, the primary excitatory transmitter, neurotransmitter used half of the time, GABA, the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter used about a third of the time, acetylcholine used by motor neurons and accounting for 5% of synapses, and then the monoamines are used in about 1% and they include dopamine, which is key in the reward pathway, norepinephrine or adrenaline, critical to our fight or flight response, and serotonin, which is key in our mood. There are also other types of neurotransmitters such as neuropeptides or short chain amino acids, and lipid and gaseous neurotransmitters such as nitric oxide, NO, which can be synthesized on demand. There's also the neuroendocrine system, which releases hormones, causing slower acting but more permanent changes in the body. The brain is locked in a vault of darkness, so how does it know what to do? Answer, it uses our senses, taste, smell, touch, vision, hearing, and proprioception, our awareness of our body in space, to receive information from the outside world via sensory receptors and specific sensory organs such as our eyes, our ears, and our skin. Fun fact, the eyes are basically an extension of the brain, which is why vision often overpowers the rest of the senses. How the sensory organs respond to stimuli in the environment and relay that to the brain depends on the type of information, what part of the body is stimulated, and how intense or long the signal is. If a stimulus is repeatedly presented, our body will adapt to it over time and react to it less and less so it can devote its energy elsewhere. And for us to notice a stimulus, it needs to be about 2% different from another stimulus. This is called Fechner's Just Noticeable Difference, proven using Weber's Law. There are many types of somatosensory sensations, or sensations involving the skin, which include tactile, proprioceptive, thermal, pain, and pruritic or itch sensations. The skin is made of three layers, the outer epidermis, the middle dermis, and the inner hypodermis, and is extremely important as an organ which protects us, helps regulate our temperature, allows for smooth movement, and more. Tactile sensations, or sensations of touch, are mediated by mechanoreceptors, which sense stimuli and physically or mechanically open, and fire when stimuli make contact with the skin. There are a variety of mechanoreceptors, which can sense light touch, pressure, stretching, and vibration. A map of somatosensory coding, called the somatosensory homunculus, or little man, coined by Wilder Penfield, show that certain areas of the brain, such as our hands and face, have a much greater density of receptors, and thus a much greater portion of cortex, or outer brain area, devoted to it. Moving on to pain, or nociception, there are three types of receptors, mechanical, thermal, and chemical, which react to a variety of painful or noxious stimuli. There is fast pain, mediated by E-delta receptors, and slow or emotional pain, mediated by C receptors. Pain is not pleasant, but it's critical to our survival, as it tells our body that something is wrong and we need to fix it. Now on to the auditory system, which is known as our hairy sense, due to hair-like cilia on top of the auditory receptors. The auditory system senses sound, 
which is basically vibrations of molecules in the air. Fun fact, the reason you can't hear in space is that space is a vacuum with no molecules, unlike air, which is full of them. The auditory transduction pathway is roughly as follows. Sound waves travel through our ear canal and hit our tympanic membrane, or eardrum, which causes three little bones, or ossicles, called malleus, incus, and stapes, to move and amplify the vibration. Then, the stapes pushes against the oval window, and the vibrations enter the snail-shaped cochlea in the inner ear. From there, the sound vibrations cause fluid in the cochlea to ripple, which causes stereocilia, or hair-like bundles that sit on top of hair cells, to move. As the stereocilia stretches, ion channels are mechanically opened, allowing ions to rush in and a depolarization to occur, which stimulates the auditory nerve connected to the hair cell. The auditory nerve then sends a signal to the brain where it is interpreted as a specific sound that we can recognize. Hair cells at the base of the cochlea sense higher vibrations or a higher pitch, while hair cells, hair cells at the top sense lower vibrations. The vestibular system is a next door neighbor to the cochlea in the inner ear and is responsible for our balance and awareness of our body in space. There are three semicircular canals containing fluid called endolymph, and each is situated in a different plane for up and down head movement like nodding yes, shaking side to side like nodding no, and tilting the head. All three connect with the ampulla where, using a similar mechanism as the auditory system, the stereocilia bend do depending on the head movement and depolarizations are elicited and travel to the brain. There are also the autolith organs, which use this mechanism as well, but the stereocilia bend due to the movement of calcium carbonate crystals called otoliths on top of the stereocilia, which then communicate with the brain as well. This allows for the sensation of linear, so horizontal and vertical, movement and acceleration. The five fundamental tastes are sour, bitter, salty, sweet, and umami, or meaty. We taste these as food molecules as they pass through taste pores into our taste buds, which are contained in our papillae, or bumps on the tongue. Within the dozens of taste buds within each papillae are dozens more taste cells, which are specialized receptors that bind to food molecules using cilia. Type 1 taste cells have sodium channels in them and sense salty molecules. Type 2 taste cells have what are called TRP receptors and G-coupled protein receptors, or GPCRs, and sense sweet, bitter, and umami molecules. And type 3 have proton and potassium channels and sense sour molecules. You could say type 1s are salty, type 3s are sour since they got third place, and the rest are happy to be in second place. Some people are super tasters who have a normally large number of taste buds above the average of about 2,000 to 5,000, and our taste cells regenerate every two weeks once damaged. Every area of the tongue can perceive every type of taste, and some even argue that fat is another primary taste. How do we smell? Our olfactory system uses a lining of mucus in the top part inside our nose to trap air molecules in a lining of mucus. These then make contact with olfactory cells, which causes depolarizations based on the type of molecule. These signals then travel via the olfactory nerve to the olfactory bulb in the brain, where the air molecules are perceived as a certain scent. Since the olfactory bulb is so closely connected with the limbic system, or our emotional system, smell has a strong emotional component to it. This is why a batch of cookies can elicit such strong emotions and evoke old memories. Additionally, humans are good at detecting and distinguishing odors, but we're not very good at naming them. Moving on to the visual system, we process light, or rather differences in the intensity of light, in an incredibly tiny portion of the full electromagnetic spectrum, only wavelengths of about 380 to 760 nanometers. Light is refracted or bent by the cornea and lens and hits the photoreceptors, or visual receptors, called rods and cones in the retina, the back of the eye. The rods are responsible for dark vision and visual acuity, whereas the cones are responsible for color vision. Fun fact, Nearsighted individuals who can see near but not far have overly curved corneas, which bend the light too far in front of the retina, whereas farsighted individuals who can see far but not near have overly flat corneas, which bends the light too far behind the retina. So, then the rods and cones connect to bipolar cells and retinal ganglion cells, which communicate with the brain, and the brain actually has to flip the images created by the retina since it's upside down. Additionally, the fact that we have two eyes allows us to perceive depth since the eyes are at slightly different locations and angles. Finally, the optic nerve, the nerve connecting the eyes to the brain, actually crosses at the optic track, which means that the innermost part of our eyes connect with opposite sides of the brain. Now onto our motor system, which is responsible for our reflexes and planned motor movements. We have three types of muscles, smooth muscle in our organs, cardiac muscle in our heart, 
and skeletal muscle or striated muscle, which moves us around. Muscles are basically bundles of bundles of bundles of fibers and connect with motor neurons at the neuromuscular junction, where acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter used. The motor system consists of the pyramidal system, which includes upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons, and the cortex connecting to our head and neck and the rest of the body, respectively, and the extrapyramidal system consisting of the basal ganglia and cerebellum. The basal ganglia is important in motor planning, while the cerebellum coordinates motor movement and judge distance, and also accounts for half of the neurons in the CNS. Deficits in the pyramidal system, or the motor cortex, and association cortex can cause apraxias, or various inabilities to carry out movements, despite there being no muscle paralysis. Damage to the cerebellum can cause uncoordinated movement, and damage to the basal ganglia can cause movement disorders such as Parkinson's and Huntington's. Next is reproduction, which is the union of gametes, or sex cells, of males and females to produce offspring and propagate the species. Fertilization, or growth, of a new living being can occur either outside the body, such as in an egg, or inside the body, like inside the womb for humans. External fertilization tends to occur in the water to keep the egg from drying out, and thus is much less effective due to predation of young and washing away of eggs. As the survival rate is low, the amount of offspring produced is often very high. Internal fertilization tends to produce much less offspring, but they have a much higher survival rate. There is also parthenogenesis, or virgin birth, in which the female lays an egg that is a clone, and thus there are no males. Females tend to be more selective when choosing a mate and spend a lot of energy on fewer eggs. Males tend to be much less selective and produce lots of sperm cells in order to spread their genes as much as possible. They also compete a lot with other males and use courtship rituals to, gain, to try to gain females' attention. Different species have different strategies, where some like bees will have one female with many males, some will stay with their mate for life as in birds, some have one female with many males as in gorillas, and some like giraffes have many different mates for both males and females. It's important to distinguish the stages of sexual development. Genetic sex depends on the chromosomes present, XX for females and XY for males. Gonadal sex depends on the presence of the Y chromosome. And phenotypic sex depends on the presence of male gonads and internal organs such as the testes and wolfium duct, or the ovaries and malarian duct in females, and also the external sex organs or genitalia. It's important to note that up to the sixth week of prenatal or before birth development, we're all basically females. Then the SRY or sex determining region on the Y chromosome comes in and causes the testes to form. There are also many sex differences in terms of the brain with males having a larger amygdala, visual cortex, and more local or regional activity, while females have a larger hippocampus, greater sensitivity to social cues and stresses, and more bilateral activation across the brain. Also note that gender identity is not fixed and can vary from person to person depending on how they want to identify. Now, moving on to homeostasis, the maintenance of our body's internal environment within a precise physiological range, especially by our hypothalamus. The hypothalamus receives input from throughout the body about any systems that need attention, such as cells in the body needing fuel. It then talks with the anterior and posterior pituitary gland to release hormones into the bloodstream, which elicits a behavior such as hunger, which results in a behavior such as eating, which corrects a problem. It helps us get the 20 essential amino acids we need, nine of which we don't make, and 15 vitamins and minerals. Half of the energy we need is used for our basic functioning, which is called our basal metabolism. When we don't need energy immediately, we store glucose as glycogen in our liver and muscle and fat as triglycerides in our fat tissue in a process called anabolism, and later break them back down into glucose, fatty acids, and ketones during catabolism. For us to use glucose, we need insulin, which acts as a key of sorts and lets the glucose into cells for use. When there's a lack of insulin production, this can cause type 1 diabetes, and when there's an insufficient response to insulin, this can cause type 2 diabetes. There are many hormones which control our hunger and satiation cycle, including ghrelin, which allows us to be hungry, and insulin, which allows us to stop eating. The body also regulates the amount of water and the water solute concentration, telling us to drink water or eat salt if we have too little water or too little salt. Since the cell membrane is impermeable to most solutes or dissolved solids, fluids will move in a process called osmosis in whatever direction there are more solutes in order to balance out the concentrations. Finally, we maintain our body temperature at about 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit, the optimal temperature for the enzymes in our body. If we get too cold, we'll preserve heat by shivering and constricting our blood vessels, and if we get too hot, we'll breathe more and sweat more. 
The hypothalamus, or more specifically the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN, or master clock, also regulates our biological rhythm such as our sleep and wake cycles. It integrates external input such as light and ex internal input such as the presence of certain transcription factors and proteins and tells our body when it's time to be asleep or be awake. When we're asleep, we can use an electroencephalogram or EEG to measure brain waves. It uses electrodes in different positions on the scalp and measures the fluctuations in electroactivity of a large group large groups of neurons. The brain waves from lowest frequency to highest frequency are very slow delta waves, slow theta waves, moderate alpha waves, high beta waves, and even higher gamma waves. Alpha and beta waves are typically seen while we're awake, since alpha waves are seen when we are resting quietly, and beta waves are seen when we are alert and attentive. During sleep, we cycle through four main stages that take about 90 to 110 minutes per cycle. Stage one is a transition stage between wakefulness and sleep marked by theta waves. Stage two is marked by theta activity as well, but also sleep spindles, or short bursts of waves, and K-complexes, or sudden sharp waveforms. Stage three is marked by delta waves, and during the stage we're in very deep sleep. It's hard to wake someone up at this stage. Finally, we have REM, or rapid eye movement, which is marked by beta and theta activity. These brain waves almost match those of an awake person, which is why we tend to have dreams during the stage. So why do we sleep? We still don't fully understand sleep, but th some theories are, one, sleep allows us to conserve energy and avoid predators at times when food is not available. Two, sleep is a period of restoration, repairing daily wear and tear. Three, sleep helps clear out toxins and waste products. And four, sleep aids memory consolidation, allowing us to consolidate the key events of the day. Additionally, we know that when sleep is disrupted, it can cause a lack of focus and memory, and even hallucinations, and even sleep disorders such as insomnia or difficulty sleeping. Narcolepsy, which is frequent unexpected period of, periods of sleepiness throughout the day, somnambulism or sleepwalking, and sleep apnea, where breathing stops several times throughout the night. Now, on to emotions. There are about six universal facial expressions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. And they help us deal quickly with a wide range of situations and to communi communicate to people around us how we're feeling. There are several existing theories attempting to explain emotions, the 1890 James Lang theory says that we experience emotion in response to a physiological change in our body. So for example, we experience anger because our heart rate increases, our muscles tense, and our face becomes hot and flushed. The 1921 Ken Bard theory says that our physiological response and feelings occur simultaneously, but also independently, meaning they're not dependent on each other. Stanley Sachter's 1975 two-factor theory of emotion says that the physiological response or physical arousal is important but just as important is how we cognitively label the experience based on our current state, social influences, and past experiences. There are many different regions involved in, the, in emotion, the amygdala being a key structure, especially in mediating fear. We know that since lesions or damage to the amygdala lessens the fear response. Yet another emotional behavior we experience is stress, which is often elicited by our fight or flight response as we interpret a situation as dangerous to us and our body releases hormones such as adrenaline which increases our attention and heart rate and breathing rate, readying us for action. Stress is often useful in the short term to provide a boost of attention or keep us alive, but long-term stress can compromise our immune system, such as by suppressing the production of antibodies, which makes us more susceptible to sickness. Speaking of attention, there are many types of attention which allow us to process our environment. Selective attention is where we focus selectively on a certain stimulus, and divided attention is where we tend to multiple stimuli at a time. The problem is, attention is like a flashlight. The places that you shine it on become clear and you can focus on them, but the parts around the light beam are much harder to see and focus on. This is why multitasking is not really a thing, since your brain cannot efficiently do two tasks at once, instead constantly switching between them. You can also divide attention into voluntary attention, like consciously choosing to look at something, and involuntary or reflexive attention, like unconsciously and reflecting looking at someone after they drop a plate. We also have many executive functions, impulse control, which is our ability to think before we act, working memory, which is our ability to hold onto information for a short time and use it during a task, and behavioral flexibility, which is our ability to shift our attention and behavior and change strategies. These executive functions are mediated by our frontal lobe, particularly the prefrontal cortex, since they are higher cognitive abilities. Next is language, which is arguably one of the human behaviors which distinguishes us from other living things. Language is defined as a human method of communication that involves the use of complex sound combinations. Unlike other animals, which communicate mostly to convey a biological state such as hunger or fear, we can use language to talk about the past, the future, and abstract ideas. 
The right side, or hemisphere of the brain, specializes in perceiving nonverbal information, such as facial expressions, while the left hemisphere specializes in speech and language. It also contains a region called Broca's area, which allows us to talk, and Wernicke's area, which allows us to understand speech. How do we talk, though? Generating speech consists of three main steps. First, our lungs take in air and then push it back out. Second, as the air is pushed out, it passes through the larynx or voice box, which contains our vocal cords. The vocal cords then oscillate or vibrate at a certain frequency, which determines the pitch of the sound. Finally, the air exits our throat and out through our mouth and nose. Since the 1960s, scientists have agreed that the specific shape of our nasal and oral cavities is what allows us to make the sounds we make. But there's some evidence that other animals may also be able to produce human speech as well. Genetics may also play a role in speech. For example, mutations or alterations in a gene called FOXP2 cause many speech deficits. We also know that the first years after birth are a critical period for language acquisition, and it is critical to develop proper language skills while we are young. It's also a lot easier to learn new, new languages as a child. There are also many different language disorders called aphasias, which are often caused by strokes or brain damage, and developmental problems such as dyslexia or difficulty reading. Remember the magic number three. The three what's of memory are semantic or fractual memory, episodic memory or memory of events, and procedural memory or memory of how to do tasks. The three ones of memory are sensory memory or very brief memories held by our senses, short-term memory, and long-term memory. The three hows of memory are encoding or processing stimuli, storage or storing the memory, and retrieval or calling, recalling the memory. Memory can also go awry with damage to the brain. For example, patient HM had a lesion to his hippocampus and surrounding areas, which resulted in partial retrograde amnesia, or an inability to remember past memories, and extreme anterograde amnesia, or total inability to form new memories. Other famous patients are NA, KC, and ML. Memory is also closely linked to learning. As Socrates says, once said, there's no learning without remembering. There's non-associative learning, such as habituation, or learning to ignore repeated stimuli, sensitization, or learning to pay more attention to certain stimuli. And there's also associative learning, such as operant conditioning, or learning to do or avoid certain things to get a, re a reward or avoid a punishment, and classical conditioning, or learning to associate stimuli with each other. Note, check the office Dwight Altoids for a funny example. There's also spatial learning, or learning to navigate the environment, and procedural learning, or learning how to perform a task, like riding a bike through practice. The hippocampus, thalamus, and prefrontal cortex all communicate in a love triangle of sorts to store memory and convert short-term memory to long-term memory. But what exactly is memory, and where exactly is it stored? The theory surrounding this is called the engram, or memory trace, due to a change in the brain. We still don't fully understand memory, but some theories are that it could be stored in RNA, or certain neural circuits, or even physiological changes at the synapse. This is closely connected to a term called neuroplasticity which is the ability of neurons to be remodeled in response to experience and the environment. This mechanism is due to a process called long-term potentiation, where synaptic connections between neurons become stronger with frequent activation. Finally, we'll discuss the disorders of cognition. Many of the most common disorders are stress-related, such as depression and anxiety, and also developmental-related, such as schizophrenia, ADHD, and ASD. Depression affects at least 10% of the population and is linked to a dysfunction in the hypothalamus pituitary gland, adrenal gland, or the HPA axis, where there is too much cortisol released and there is less activity in blood flow. Anxiety affects at least 18% of U.S. adults at some point in their life and is linked to HPA axis dysfunction as well, but in this case where the amygdala is overactive and the prefrontal cortex or rational brain is underactive. Schizophrenia affects about 1% of the population, is linked to too much dopamine and serotonin, and too little glutamate and acetylcholine, and is often marked by hallucinations and delusions. ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, affects around 5% of kids and adults, and is linked to certain underactive and overactive brain circuits. ASD, or Autism Spectrum Disorder, is linked to a thicker frontal cortex, th uh, thinner temporal lobe, and smaller basal ganglia and is often marked by repetitive behaviors and trouble with communication or in social settings. All of the disorders have a level of genetic heritability to them, but they are also linked to many environmental factors, where it may be infections or drug abuse or schizophrenia, or medications during pregnancy or air pollutants for ASD. There are also many drugs that have been developed and are being developed for these disorders, but they only treat the symptoms and not the underlying cause, and can cause many harmful side effects. So this is a field that remains ripe for disruption. Thanks for listening, and I hope you found this crash course helpful.